Uh, okay, hi everyone, thanks for your patience. So, today, please welcome Dr. Say and Dr. Jacob from the Orthopedics Department. They are the new residents. And, um, they'll be giving us some case based discussions on orthopedic emergencies. So, uh, please make them very welcome and hope you enjoy it. Thanks, thanks, James. Thanks for, the, for inviting me to present today. Um, just want to know a bit about the background of the groups here. What, what year level are we at? So, first year, second year? Third years, fourth years, second years, hands up, second years. Okay, good. good. It's more keen than I was when I was second year, to be honest with you. Um, and any third years here? And final years? All right, those are the first years as well. So that, that's, that's the first years. Oh, good. Um, so anyone interested in fourth meetings at all? Or too early? To decide. I guess I'm assuming you're all interested in at least surgery as a as a field. Um, look, orthopedics is a field where there's a lot of orthopedic emergencies that are really good to know about um, because you're going to encounter them in any type of surgical field that you can do. Um, particularly in the emergency department, where you're not, you don't think that you need to encounter these problems. So I'm hoping that I'm going to give you a good overview of all this, but I want to keep this as interactive as possible. I'll try to gauge some of the questions to the different year levels, um, and we'll go from there. And, um, if I can't, if nobody can find the answer, James, give me the guy who picked up today. I'm hoping the first year will make that be, and then the second year is almost like something about pathology. Yeah. I won't make it your age three diagrams, don't worry. <laughs> make it All right, so let's start with it. I want to do this as a case, and I'll leave it open for everyone else, and I'll hopefully just guide things as we go. Um, so let's start with this guy, Mr. SA. 54, has one day history of severe right knee pain. So maybe we'll start with uh, James. Why don't we get us rolling? Um, what do you think about when someone comes in with a one day history um, of right knee pain? <clears throat> Um, so I've got severe right knee pain with acute onset. Um, I'm thinking about excluding my um, my not to be excluded, um, or my, not to be missed mm -hmm. diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking uh, DVT. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking septic arthritis mm -hmm. uh, or a hemarthrosis. Those are the, the highest on my list that I want to exclude pretty quickly. Good. Then I want to think about common things. So gout can commonly present with um, pseudo gout with an acute, severely painful knee. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can think about other common things in the knee, uh, like a ruptured baker cyst or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then you go to other things like, a, is there just a skin infection or have yeah. you had a yeah. trauma or something like that? So yeah. work through my differentials that way. Yeah, so that, that's, that's what, what James done was think instantly, what is this, what am I, what's the presented? Like, what are the things that I need to know before seeing this patient that I need to exclude? And he's pretty much touched on most of the major things, or at least when he's verbalized those things, which means that when he goes and sees that patient, he kind of has an idea of what questions he wants to ask uh, when he's history. Uh, do you have anything else that yeah, when you see when you see that? No. Anyone else? Okay. Sorry. You go and see him in take history. Find out that he's been playing, he's been pretty well. He's played some golf last week, um, strained his, his knee. But he's been walking okay the last few days. Um, but yesterday he just felt unwell, and sweats, felt lethargic. Um, but woke up today immediately feeling pain. Um, unable to wait there, and he's just noticed that his legs become quite swollen. Um, put in a, he's last eaten at 7 o'clock now. Um, this is something that I want you guys to get used to whenever you see search, something that could be potentially surgical when, when they last had an easy injury. Because it will be the first question I'll ask you uh, if you can do a reverse. Um, so, of course, on what's, what's going on, maybe one of the second years. Who's the second year? So, uh, so more <laughs> <laughs> uh, although you seem to have a, a possible trauma last week, the pain doesn't seem to associate with that trauma. There seems to be an excuse inflammatory, generalized inflammatory process going on. It's sweating, it's lethargic. Mm -hmm. um, it's come on quite suddenly. 
he's made a few to be quite small and, and inflamed. Um, so you be thinking about septic up, you need to exclude septic up right at school. Um, you probably want to see what was in the joint. What, so what do you what are your what are your next steps? Yeah. When you say that, what do you mean when you say that? Uh, to aspirate the joint. Okay. Is there anything else you want to do before that? Yeah, examine the joint. Yeah. So it's important to take a history of that exam uh, because ninety percent of of these problems you can actually this is really true for things most of the time you can get the um, diagnosis with just history exam. Yeah, I'll probably be able to say very the next round I can just scan with my hand. We know what fracture that, but um, but I'm seriously lucky history and exam. And then you go from there. So you said examination was more what are you looking for in your exams? Um, we want to feel the warmth um, mm -hmm. and tenderness. There is a mark. Mm -hmm. If he's quite small, you can look what he examines the joint. Um, if he lost range of movement, mm -hmm. um, when he says he's not able to wait there, um, you'd be looking for any like obviously you anticipatory. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't sound like you had anything like that. Um, but yeah, you could test your movements. Okay. Um, what do you do before you touch his joint? Inspect it. You really take a step back. You look at the patient. Does he look well or not well? I would assume he doesn't look very well. Probably doesn't. It's the right um, angles. You look at his results. Does he have temperature right here? What's his heart rate doing? And the reason I'm saying this is because all of these people have positive blood cultures that will be accepted as well. So those things might point in the direction of how very this problem is. Uh, very good. Um, Jacob, do you have anything else you want to add to the examination? No, I think what you touched on, look, feel, move, measure, special tests. Yeah, that's what I was taught when I was brought up. And, um, with the patient with queries that pick up right, it's doing that, it's going to become fairly obvious, obvious early on. You're going to play off of that what's called pseudo paralysis. They want to move it because it's so painful. And basically, if you've got that, your diagnosis is set to the So, mm -hmm. yeah, question. I was just going to ask, like, is it possible that somebody has set the up actually bend their knees so that you can get the results? Yeah, I was going to say, yes, yeah. so they weren't they were near it, really. No. Um, He's not just epic arthritis though, any one of these small joints you can't assess the movements. And so uh, often you'll find someone who comes in with you know maybe a small tibial plasma fracture or some <coughs> minor injury inside and they've got a little bit of swelling, it's pointless to assess the movements at that point. You tell them to come back to clinic in about one or two weeks and then you can assess them clinically. Um here you would need to take a lot of it's not very good much, you know. We'll know. So you look at that joint and the thing on the examination is a little bit the other joints. Um, you find that none of the other ones are affected. There's no trauma that you can see. Um, no procedures to the You look at, you can see any surgical scars, you can see any um, incisions or anything like that. Um, oh, I'll just want you to see But anyway, exact, no dog bites or animal bites. I've had a patient come in who on history, but I thought it was, was gout, but then when you actually looked at his leg, he had a big dog bias just the bottom of his foot. And that was the real key to the diagnosis. And they didn't think to just have the joint at that time. Otherwise, past medical history is not that uh, exciting. Sorry, Jacob mentioned this the look feel good principles of, of what orthopedics is just look at them in general and look at the joints, feel. So it's a warm and try to move some of the ranges. So it's just basic principles. Okay, so it's very tender in the joint line. It's holding his knee in about 20, 30 degrees. Why, why might that be? Doesn't that allow the most space in the joint? Yeah, good, good. Um, and he's only um, ranging at 20 degrees, so not very much. So. Investigations, um, blood tests is what we normally start with. So, what blood tests do you want to do? Um, maybe one of the final use. 
which is soft tissue stuff here. This is all fluid that's not meant to be in there. The other thing is, is the quadriceps tendon, which comes through here, usually has a sharp margin into the patella and then a sharp margin out. You can see that that margin is being blurred. So I'll try to bring up some other x rays that kind of show that. Those are the three things I feel the most useful in the knee x ray um, to see the soft tissue infusion. So you go and do a knee aspirin. Um, who wants to interpret this? Maybe a fact. So first of all, you take it out. So you do. You just do it. We'll go. I'll say something about how to do it, and then you see that it comes out looking like it's pretty yellow. Is that normal or abnormal? Fifty-fifty. What color do you think side of your food normally is? Yeah, it's clear. It's straw. It's straw colored. So is that clear straw colored? Sorry, it's abnormal. It's got 62,000 white cells. Is that normal or abnormal? A little abnormal or a lot abnormal? Yeah, a lot abnormal. The rest of what you've sent for them is pending. No. It's important to say that other than we aspirate a little bit of fluid, you need to send it for probably all the major things every time you request it. You need to ask for a cell count, which means that practically for the final year students, you need to send out an EDTA tube. Okay, that's, that's a good EDTA tube. Correct. One, one part of the aspirin has to be sent with EDTA tube, the FBA tube, then FBA tube. Otherwise, you don't get a cell count. Okay. And you can see that the most critical point of this thing is everything else is pending here except the cell counts. And that's very, 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 very typical. The next thing you need to send it in is one of those yellow jars, which is the urine specimen collection jars. And that takes to the brand setting across the field. You need to request a Congo red stain or do you know what does Congo red stain look for? Does anyone know? Or capsule? No. So, Congo red stain looks for crystals. Okay, positive. If it's negatively biofringent on Congo red stain, it means that they have capsule crystals. Positively means they've got pseudograph CPG, CPPG crystals. Okay, so you need to actually write that on your request form. Then you need to request cultures and sensitivities. So, Jacob, what are you going to do now? So, the, the cutoff for white soil count for joint aspirin is 50,000. Once over 50,000, the likelihood ratio of septic arthritis is like eight or nine times greater than if it was less than 50,000. So, you treat uh, joint as septic arthritis. So who would take this patient to be right on based on this result? I would. I would. Based on the history, the examination, we're all pretty convinced. Based on something greater than 50,000 heart cells, I'd be calling my boss and saying, can you take this patient to be here? Yeah. What happens with less than 50,000? So your index of suspicion is definitely less. Um, but again, this is all based on what your pretest probability is based on history and examination findings. If someone presents as septic with a, a monoarticular painful arthropathy, a good history for septic arthritis, and the count's only 40,000, you still think that that's going to be septic arthritis. And someone, for example, has a prosthetic joint, your um, tolerance for a certain cell count to get is less. So it's just another tool for you to use in terms of making the diagnosis. But if anyone asks you what cell count would indicate such a we just say 50,000. But really, it's just 
it's a spectrum. Once you get up to 100,000, then the likelihood ratio is like 20 or 30, so it's more likely to work. And also, the polymorphic in clear count as well. I can't remember what the count is, but it's 90 percent. But a high count like that again suggests septic arthritis. So does that mean higher count leads to lower count? Percentage. Conservative. It's clean. What does what is conservative mean? Just an antibiotic. Yeah, look at this day, you can probably do antibiotics. Um, so we asked this question before, and I just touched on it now. Um, about the antibiotic treatments um, when you start antibiotics. The answer is you should always take an aspirin before you start antibiotics and probably conscious. Um, the main reason is antibiotics will affect my aspirin results significantly to the point where I might not even see it be a negative ground stain and I might be reassured by that. The other thing is that I don't actually know what I'm treating for the next six to eight months. So it's a really difficult situation. Um, the infectious disease team here backs us in advocating that we always think something first. But there might be times when you will start antibiotics without any of this. Those are only someone who is basically so accepted, they're accepting shock, um, they're um, unstable.
this whole thing. All right. So this next case, we've got a 17-year-old who's had a terrifying accident called Kildur Mahan Lars on a black bus um, while landing on a one-year jump. So what's your initial assessment? She tosses that as a following year question. So you can get it sent out to Porsche if you need a first rotation and first day you rock up and this happens. You know, it sounds funny, but it kind of actually does. So I mean, James, even if you just talk about what are the things you're, you're worried about and the things you're thinking when you hear the story, do you have an approach to any multi potential polytrauma patient coming into leaving? What do you, what do, you do? Um, so knowing the speed that they're traveling at is pretty important because that's that, that gives me an idea of how bad the injuries I'll be expecting. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm assessing this patient, I'm going to be going through my ABCDEs uh, first off. Yeah. Just so, stopping, does everyone know what ABCs mean in terms of assessing a patient? Analgesia, and maxilla. Clinic. That's the orthopedic term. Yeah, is... <laughs> so, airway, breathing, circulation, just in case someone wants to pause a bit afraid to talk about it. Keep going. Um, so, I'm looking at my airway, making sure that the patient's got their own airway, and if it's because if they've got a um, soft tissue or facial trauma, then I want to be. I want to make sure that their airway is uh, patent and can be maintained. Uh, yeah. Then I, I want to look at their breathing. Um, are they are they breathing on their own? Are they having any difficulty? Uh, and in a patient like in a trauma patient, you probably have a low threshold for intubating if there's any abnormalities there. Um, assessing their cardiovascular status. I want my vital signs: and heart rate, blood pressure. Um, what do they feel like peripherally? Have I got pulses? That kind of stuff. Are they bleeding anywhere? Um, D, I want to assess for any disabilities, are there any obvious fractures, get a glucose level um, and then expose the patient, What other, are there any other fractures or bleeding that's going to be more life threatening um, and then I'm going to go through my secondary um, assessment of the patient from there. Right. Does everyone understand what you just said? Right, very good. So I'll just read a bit more about this guy's story. So. 10 a.m., flipped over the front wheels, landed on the vertex with runs and outstretched hands. Um, he did mobilize afterwards. He was wearing a helmet at the scene, which he took off um, and walked around. Um, the only thing he really actually complained of was pain in his left wrist um, and some numbness in the hand. Um, so he initially, this is a patient sort of um, I was involved with. So he initially presented to a uh, more peripheral hospital and then uh, they, they told him to come to Wangaratta Hospital. Um, trauma center. Yeah. <laughs> Huge trauma center. Um, he was seen in the ED, put in the collar, and the ED doctors were doing those exact things and assessing him. Look, at the end of the day, they just thought he was not too bad. Um, he had good GCS, he was alert, his hemodynamic was stable. Primary survey, which is the ABC that he was talking about, was completely normal. Um, he had no spinal tenderness, um, which you think about any time someone has a trauma. Um, and when you guys end up doing a bit more trauma-like support, you'll be learning how to do a little bit more of that. Tenderness in his left wrist, and he's a small number of these. Your investment is active, I'm going to change that to the next few months. So, investigations and imaging. So, yeah, chest x ray, pelvic x ray, which happens in all the four series as a uh, initial assessment, and so what's, that's supposed to be just normal. What are, what are, what are these? The pelvic button. This is a left or wrist x-ray. Um, next one. Does anyone see anything obvious? Can 
can you point to that? Can you not point that out for the rest of the people see? Or just point in general where are you well where they're 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 where they Itself. Plastic surgeons here will mainly manage this here on um, the places it's all the eggs. And does anyone know what this part is? I'm pressing up my finger. Yeah, it's a lunar X. And which bone is this here? No, it doesn't say the word. It's the capitate. That's meant to be sitting up there in that little area that looks empty. So that's one of the things that they do. And they, they call this the double crescent sign because you see two crescents there. The main reason why we're all studying orthopedic programs is, is you won't leave these alone at the nights. So uh, I was, I remember walking past this in the ED at about 11 pm and didn't leave the hospital until about 4 am. Operating on this, so we pretty much will work on this immediately. Um, I said that he had some numbers in his hands. Does anyone wonder why that might be? You guess why he might have that sensational call? There's a number of nerves that could have been mm -hmm. either um, have some inflammatory injury or have been directly um, severed. By this kind of traumatic dissipation. So, which nerve is at risk? Um, the superficial branches of the median nerve. The superficial branch of the median nerve usually comes a bit more proximal and sort of leaves here. It usually is intact. Okay. Well, the, is it the AIM? Is that, is yeah, that one? And be more general. Be Where's the AIM come from? The median nerve. Yeah. So the medium nerve goes to the carpal tunnel. Now it's compressed here. Okay, so they usually have fingers with sensational loss. So you need to do carpal tunnel control with decompression usually on these patients early. Um, with all trauma patients, you may need to consider doing further imaging of other systems. They usually get other series like CT brain, CTC spine, chest, depending on what you think is the time. And just, just wanted to highlight you need to use the same time for every manner. Agents humanically unstable. You don't need a CT. Um, so that's just a bit about perilinex. Most of that I talked about. Um, so that's sort of what it's meant to look like. That was that cavitate bone that I was trying to highlight that sits in that little tube there. It's not put out. So we initially reduced it. And these little structures are called pay wires that come through here. And you, what you do is you put these through the carbon bar into the proximal and distal row, and you allow those areas to fibrose so and you can tear the scapular ligament ligaments uh, and the other carbon ligaments at the time. Um, and that's called stabilization surgery. All right, let's look at another case, another high speed trauma. Um, so I had an MBA in a tree at 100 kilometers an hour. So I brought a swing right at about 2 a.m. So initial assessments. Is there any difference in the original assessment approach to this guy in the last one? So is this guy has got three in his own. His A's are fine, B's fine, but his C's not okay. He's in hemorrhagic shock. He's tachycardic, he's going up to 180, systolic blood pressure, 80, with severe blood loss. And so you decide that you activate your massive transfusion protocol because he needs blood. Um, does anyone know what a fast scan is? So it's, it's negative. So he has no bleeding, that he doesn't bleed, none of his pelvis. 
And nowadays, a lot of smart people use the just put the ultrasound up and look at happening on as well. Uh, but on his knees, we see that he's got open fractures of his right femur, both tipped in, his right ankle, his own angled foot. And other injuries are relatively not important. Sorry. Very little investigations if you do a trauma survey. Sorry. Most centers here, they will do an x ray. Most centers will do a basic x ray for you, but a lot of centers won't. Sorry. The other injuries he did have was he had some he was hung off the abdomen. You can't see that here, but that's superficial. Cervical spine, usually assessed by looking at the anterior posterior column, is still like this. This is all it's relatively stable. It's not much. I'm going to focus on today. Anyone know what this is? Yeah, sorry, it's from the it's a call. This is what a long confusion looks like. Do you need to do anything about that? Probably not. No. Yeah. Sorry, he's got. Anyone want to sum up what he's got in terms of his fear? This is the distance CT of his fear. It's X ray. So complex commuted open fractures, the mid shaft of the fear. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't like the word complex, not fear, because it confuses me. I just <laughs> use open and closed. Okay. It's simple and complicated. Okay. Because I'm sure you would really use the word you were saying, I was saying that it's complex as it is stuffed. It's yeah, stuffed. Um, these are all open fractures, and this is what the foot looks like. And that's um, my displaced humor. So, would you, um, would you provide any traction on those demons, even though they come? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the that the ultimate dilemma that I was faced with. He's, you can't feel ulcers, but you know that he's got a stop blood pressure of 70 to 80, despite you putting in a match to parents usual protocol. He comes in unsolicited because the emergency department or the ambulance sorry are very scared to do anything with that leg unless you want to be a doctor. That's not really what it's about. Would you slot it? I'm feeling Well, I'm asking, <laughs> well I'll, I'll pose the question to you and we'll, we'll explore that. You can't so. really put, put any traction or force on that because it's already Just fragmented. A, yeah, so if you put force down to, if you use traction force through here, then you're just separating these two fragments, you're already separated, which mm -hmm. is not really helping for us. Yeah, that's good points. Most traction devices and Thomas lens type things have multiple contraction points, so you can have contraction of a lot of different parts uh, together. Um, traction is excellent, so you need to make sure this paint is under contraction. So the first thing you need to do. The reason is that you decrease that blood volume, that sort of the blood volume area of that whole leg, and it acts as its tamponade. Once you do that, the blood pressure picks up. Because now they're no longer pouring out the blood through their leg. Okay. okay. So in World War One, the Thomas strip was introduced, which has uh, reduced the mortality of an open femur fracture from greater than eighty percent in soldiers to less than eight percent, just solely on the fact that it did what I just explained. So stop patients from bleeding out. So it's simple intervention that can have a huge benefit for the patient. So that's probably what saved this guy's life in the end. Uh, was that? Someone made the decision that he needs to be in traction. Okay. So 
Can you do it with your own scan? Yes. Yes. 100%. It physically means that, so traction means that you're putting pressure down the leg this way, in this direction. And have you seen what a Thomas or a traction type sport looks like? I'm just getting a it's, it's basically going to cause a pull force down on all the on all the legs. Because once once this has been fractured, CT short splint. Look up CT six splint. That's what you patients will come into the emergency up where. <laughs> so once once you once you have femoral shaft fracture or any other major long body fractures. The natural direction of the muscles causes it to shorten, right? Mm -hmm. And that shortening is bad because it just increases your overall spherical volume. Mm -hmm. It's more likely to flex there. So we talked a little bit about the management, but I also want to talk about some management of open fractures itself. So this is a time when you do want to start antibiotics pretty early. You know, fire up washouts to make sure you give them a tetanus shot to control the bleeding. Sometimes putting on these external traction devices is not that useful. Okay. This might be a good example, but that might not be useful. Is there anything else you can do in the world if that's not working? Okay. So you just want to get rid of the leg. <laughs> Yeah, you could. You can buy your time. Out, outside of the EV as well as you can buy your EV theater, for example. So you've got an external fixation on it. Or you can use skeletal traction, which means that you've got pins inside the bone and then you separate it out. Or you can just fix it at the time. Then we're going to be a still a classification for open fractures. It's very important to classification system that I think everyone will probably use from the emergency department to orthopedics, plastics, most people would know the pistol classification. Um, so the key point is any more or less than one centimeter, we classify that as pistol one, probably not that significant, but thanks for that antibiotic coverage. Pistol two is one to ten centimeter of wounds. Um, and three, we separate it into A, B, and C. B means that it needs some soft tissue coverage, which means you need to refer to plastics um, or flap surgery. And C means it needs some vascular damage, which just helps us on the parts to know which ones we need to refer. So this is a good example of a still a one. And that's a two. That would be a 3A, this will probably pop that back in and close the wound. This is a 3B, because it doesn't matter what I do in public, I am a suture and I can't close that. And that's a C. That's an X. Next case, just going back to yeah, vascular damage. How do you prioritize in terms of the simple question first or which you suggest that the also always comes first? <laughs> so if you're gonna to try to fix the vascular damage, you need the normal anatomy to be there before you can fix it, because otherwise if you try and fix it later down the track, you can ruin someone's skin graft or vascular graft. So both come first. And most of the time. Uh, X fixes don't take too long. Like the orthodox will be in and out generally in like an hour or so. It'll be quite quick. But then the vascular plastics will come along and do their thing and be in there for like six hours or something. Really. So, uh, yeah, also it's always good. Yeah, it's look before anything, you probably just to get rid of some structural stability. If you can't provide structural stability, then you need some sort of adaptation. Actually, the thing is, with some of those cases where they're vastly compromised or 
biologically compromised, you reduce the fracture or restore normal alignment, and that can often fix the problem. If you've got a certain dislocation and you know, an artery is compressed, reduce it, and then the artery is normal flow resistance. So. All right, so the, the next case, we'll move away from major large traumas and we'll go to something a little bit different. So this guy comes in, he's 40 year old, crushed by a leg, on his leg uh, by a falling tree. Otherwise, pretty well. <clears throat> Let's just call it an isolated injury. So, another problem. Initial assessment, primary strong survey, completely fine. He went out of the table and so on, smooth sailing. That's the x ray you get given. Is that, is that um, adequate x ray? Yeah. 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 So let's say that was the only part of the fracture that you could see. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do, Joe? I want to assess to still the narrow back to the function. Good. What would you assess? Um, pulses and also function. So it's a function of the pulse. What nerves run distance to that point? Posterity will be confused to have tightness. Oh, I think it looks too funny to go look at anterior and posterior. It's not squared out. Any, any damage to the TBR is anterior. You know what it's like? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, it's not an Yeah. So, um, so perineal. Yep. Um, and so the deep perineal brain. Good. Uh, yeah. yeah. And there's a deep perineal association. Yep. Yeah. So you need to assess that. And what's the nerve that supplies the other side? The back. The runs with the posterior tubular artery. And that is similar name. Definitely <laughs> without the word posterior. <laughs> tubular. Tubular. <laughs> yeah. tubular. And they're all branches of the side. So you you know you refer this is part of the student question. You refer, they say to you the other edge says, look, we'll just put them with the theater tomorrow. Can you just call my residence, get them taken to the patients? Um, and can you see in a above the back slide? Um, and so, can you tell me what, you, what are you going to do? And this is a very, very, very real scenario. How are you going to make sure the patient's ready to be? This is just a practical question. How about if someone answers it? One part of the question, we can pick someone else to answer the next one. So, like, name one thing that you would do before this person gets to go to theater. Okay, very good. Oh, someone good. else to answer. Uh, give us another answer. How many friends? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah good. Anything else? Consent. <laughs> Not take someone's <laughs> paper without consent. All you need in life is consent. Analgesia. Uh, <laughs> um, Analgesia. Excellent. What are you going to charge them for? <laughs> okay, good. How much? How much I have no idea. Finally, it's cheese. How much endo are you going to charge? How old was the patient? Young. You need that eight. Sorry, there's nothing. Bye. Okay, five milligrams. We'll go talk about. We'll talk about. That's fine. That's good. We'll talk, about, we'll talk about a bit, bit more about pain relief next. But anything else other than MLGs that you want to do? Pain that's Pain that's Just killing it. Anything else? 
Would you run some initial very large plots? Yeah, so we'll do some plots. Excellent. There's one thing that the author wrote just for the backslide. Yeah, very good. Put the backslide on. Hopefully, the emergency doctors can help you with that. Is it rough to be asked to do that by yourself? YouTube does. <laughs> Learn anything off YouTube. <laughs> would you again put it 30 degrees or would you have a straight? Or? Um, it's a split. It's going to come up tomorrow. Just straight. Just something that keeps us stable. I, really, I wouldn't care if it was straight 30 degrees. If I was putting in an above me full cast. And when would I want to do that? The only scenario is that you do it above me full cast. So have like ligamentous injury or. So they had a ligamentous injury, so they just zero knee split or knee breaks. So it would be faster. Sure. Yeah, it's a good one. That's I think you said it out. That's an excellent time that I do sometimes do. Um, the main ones would be tibial shaft fractures that were going to manage non-operable. And this is not a good example of that. Those are more in the pediatric type population, and in that type of injury, I would put them in about 30 degrees. Okay, good. Let's talk about pain relief. So you carry five milligrams of NDI. Um, how frequently do you carry like five milligrams of NDI? We said you said five milligrams. How frequently do you carry five milligrams of NDI? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said the five milligrams. I did. All right. How much? How frequently do you carry it? You. How many minutes? How many hours? How many days? Yeah, that's fine. Four hourly. Um, and some Panadol. So you're right. Some Panadol. Any other analgesia? Yeah. Um, NSAID. Any particular NSAID? Any. Oh, good. I don't care which NSAID. I think they're all the same. As long as you keep it IV. And do you think pain can be cut with Panadol and Urban? No, just how would you chart the endone as, a, as required? Again, you'd say four hours. But 2 a.m. in that would be a lot of pain. Can you chart that as an Yeah, you can chart for a new doctor. Chart whatever you like, whatever you want. <laughs> But I feel like you can't chart morphine on what I be I be morphine, but that's any good. That's just because they're experienced. I myself don't like to. Well, they're mm -hmm. not allowed to. Do you think you can check it out? Yeah. No, I still have something. When would you choose to ask them? Like I said, first option, have a ring done. Just for your own, by the way. It's like renal injury, renal death. You know, that 95% gets low. And it takes lots of good for that. Um, All right, anyway, look, well, he's presenting with this problem now. So he's already maxed out his enzyme. He's given him, let's say he's had 10 milligrams of enzyme. But he's got a lot of pain. Is anyone worried? Why, and, okay, why are you worried? You worry with the to be able to shut up and try out that and potential neurovascular compromise and that Parkinson's syndrome. Good! <laughs> this is a point because this is not a joke. This happens all the time. This is a real patient. I had it two weeks ago. Seen by a night cover HMO and an anesthetic stretch. And so the night HMO didn't know what analgesia to use. Patients complaining of pain, we asked the anaesthetist to give him a hand, which he can do. The anaesthetist started him, started him on a patient controlled analgesia where he can just give as much as he likes, not recognizing the high risk of the Parkinson's syndrome um, that without compensation being repeated to him. 
sorry, this was to highlight that Parkinson syndrome is a real problem with these people. The highest risk factor for it is going to be young men in lower limb injuries. This is probably the most common injury we see that will always be prompted for. What's the treatment for Parkinson syndrome? What's the suspected of all the Parkinson's syndrome? So, pretty devastating to have this problem. Um, it's four compartments in the leg. Don't expect you to know the details of all of this, but there is ways you can assess for compartments in your own. How, if you suspect someone's got a compartment in your own, what Signs or symptoms are you going to look for? So we'll continue with you because you gave us the, the goals this kind of uh, things like what pain are they doing? So, yeah, what pain can you expect for the injury? Um, pain with passive stretch or like pain extension? Yeah. Um, and you've got the rest of that triad that comes from that, but it's very hard to know. But well, that's, that's, that's excellent. Um, I could care yeah, less about You said the two most important yeah. ones. Those are the two things that I only care about. They've got pain out of proportion and pain out of the stretch. I'd give it that shit only based on just that. Rest them if you've got to that stage, you've already missed the boat. Well, not missed the boat, you're still going to do it, but that's too late. We want to recognize it before we get to that point. What, what patients today get? They can't tell you they've got pain on passive stretch. Analgies are a problem. Is there analgies are a problem? Yeah. Is there any pressure? Yeah. In the intro of actual spaces. Yeah, and that's what that picture's kind of supposed to represent there. Um, so, what you do is you put this, um, it's called a pressure monitor system. It's, you get from here, you can stick it into the different compartments, and you need to do every single compartment, not just one, as near to the right side as possible. Um, and what you do is you get what's called a LFP, um, which is your diastolic pressure minus your intranasal pressure. Um, if any of those is less than 30, it's considered that this patient has the Parkinson's syndrome. It's not a good test. The best test is if so the patient can tell you. So you've got pain out of the morning. So you've got a patient who's today. Yeah. And um, being high risk of patients, are you doing that with the same thing? With the pressure monitoring? No, I think if you're highly suspected, then just do it with the pressure monitoring. Can you prevent this from occurring with the first test? The one that's in there, it's actually not the pressure monitoring. <laughs> 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 um, the, the, the threshold for fascia monitoring, I don't know. Putting someone for two large cuts through their leg. That seems pretty bad, but the threshold for fasciotomy should be extremely low. Now, with this guy, I'm not the only time I would say that it's, I wouldn't consider it is that it was a relatively undisplaced wheel shaft fracture, um, and the patient was completely awake and alert, and I could really assess whether or not they had high pain or clients, but they could not. And I was a little concerned. You're, Thinking about it, should be thinking about doing a fashion only. Or talking to an author registrar. Practically speaking, uh, is this in the theatre or with energies around the wall? Yeah. That's in the theatre. I guess you need to assess the actual muscle on the line. Yeah. yeah. How quickly do you have to do a fashion only? Is there a time? Yeah. How quickly do you think? Almost as soon as possible. But like, how, how fast does a muscle die? Four hours, but the nerves are die quicker. Yeah. So that's that's true. Um, we would ideally four to six hours within that mm -hmm. time period is what we try. The earlier the better, obviously. That's the number that we're trying to use. All right, I think I'm boring you guys now. So I'll go fly through this one, um, which hopefully some other surgeons. I've talked to you about.
Oh, uh, it's uh, a little weakness. She maybe has some back pain. I'll get to know all. The two lights. Does anyone already have diagnosis? Core depression. Yeah. Core depression or oh, core core minus syndrome. Yeah. So it's just a bit of not just that back pain. Usually pretty benign, non-specific. We need to look at the red flags. Um, malignancy, fracture, and blood points. If there's blood points, like a real one of the highlights. Um, disc pathology, disc prolapse, by far the most common um, symptom. But if I was to ask you guys, what are the what are the signs of someone who um, called a quinus syndrome? What, what would you expect to find? And also, it's up to everyone. Because you are depressions. Yeah, is that common or uncommon? I mean, do you mean sadly? Do you mean I think it was the in general? No, in general. Yeah, it's very common. Um, what else? You're in every tension, yeah. Well, do you see one second? Yeah. So that's something that sometimes is missed. So if they are in one they still might have your every tension. Yeah. Um, and so you need to do a blood test. Is that common or uncommon? I think it is. Yeah. The most common sign. Um, so anyone with unexplained urinary retention, you need to exclude for a quiet syndrome. Any, any other symptoms and signs? Especially a little bit more weakness. Yeah. Would yeah. yeah. you expect that to be upper motor neuron sign or a lower motor neuron So it depends on the level of the um, of the lesion, but you'd still expect it to be uh, I think it's good to be a lower motor neuron. Stage, yeah, because it, it's the motor fibers, not the actual core of itself. Yeah, so it's the nerve roots concept. Core that's core, core level, core level. Yeah, good. So I just those the sensitivities of those things, the bladder is just much as what I really wanted to highlight. We call consciousness something else, but you know, say that weakness, when we described it, that would be a lot of you need to do PR exam. And I think that's pretty obvious to everyone. That's at that level. You've got a disc bulge that's completely obliterating this one area. I know the neurosurgeons will talk to you. Hopefully, we'll talk to you about this already. Um, will we consider it for people who are as well? And the treatment is just basically originally what I'm doing is happening now, not just in the next hour. And urgent surgery will do depression because we know <coughs> the earlier we get to this, the better they're going to do long term. Sorry, some conclusion. Just I want to point out the what's being emergency. I hope I've, we've like me spoken about some of the major principles of orthopedics and the major injuries, the, um, the emergency that we so talked about, the subject of arthritis and Parkinson's syndrome, open fractures, and lot managing poly trauma and multi trauma. Um, I didn't really talk about pelvic fractures, but that would probably go with that. Open trauma or polytrauma thing, it's the same principles. Corner fine syndrome, that neurovascular compromise, the perilinex dislocations and other dislocations. Um, something I didn't mention was hip dislocations. But that's another problem. Thanks for that. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions about what would be in general? Please join me in thanking Dr. Zaid and Dr. Jacob. Um, so next week we've got the uh, Women in Surgery Forum happening on Wednesday. Um, I strongly encourage you to come along to get set up our online at the moment. We've got a stellar lineup coming, including representatives from RATS, to talk to you about some of the issues playing not just women, but all people trying to get into surgery. So it's a really great event. I really love you. Have a lot.
uh, and next week we'll have another lecture lined up for you as well. You'll see that post online. So thank you very much for coming. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks, James. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.